Well, thank you very much everyone for joining us. Um, it's lovely to see some familiar names in the participant list. Um, we're going to talk to you today about fundamental dishonesty in clinical negligence proceedings. Just a little bit of housekeeping first of all. Um, some people have submitted some questions to us in advance. We are going to try to deal with those as we go through. Um, we think we have dealt with those in the slides. But if you have any questions as we're talking, um, if you pop them please in the Q&A box. So at the bottom of your screen, you should see the little Q&A. If you pop them in there, um, whichever of us is not talking, we'll try to deal with those as we go. Um, but at the end, we'll also have a further Q&A session where we'll answer any questions that we haven't been able to answer as we go through. Um, I think that's probably all I need to say by way of housekeeping. So um, David Thompson is going to talk to you first this morning about the sort of background fundamental dishonesty, what it is, um, some of the case law, and then um, about halfway through we're going to swap and I'll talk to you about some of these sort of practical tips and considerations about how to um, prove fundamental dishonesty, how to defend allegations of fundamental dishonesty, and then as I say we'll have plenty of time at the end for questions and answers. Um, aiming to finish sort of about just before one o'clock. So, um, David, can I hand over to you? Fine. Thank you, Ella. Uh, I'm David Thompson. Um, as you can see, uh, we're uh, remotely giving this webinar. I've got my COVID cut. I make no apologies for that. It, it's the way it is. It's just a case of getting things done uh, by one's daughter um, rather than any form of barber or hairdresser. Um, what we propose to do is have a focus, of course, on the clinical negligence proceedings, but there's a, a bit of basic background that I need to go through just to um, familiarise and remind people of, of fundamental dishonesty and the provisions. Uh, I, I make no apologies for that. It makes it accessible to a wider group of people. If you're familiar, then just stick with me. We're, we're not going to go through it every case. It's just setting the scene. And next slide, please, Emma. Uh, and uh, just emphasising how things have, have changed with the, the Act and the application of it. Um, the, the emphasis emerging is a, a, using a more pragmatic and holistic approach, uh, looking for aspects of the claim that standing back from it look as if there's fundamental dishonesty, uh, according with the provisions in the Act. Uh, and then also what we're going to do is we're going to, Ella's going to explain how one gets about proving that in effect and exploring that, that issue. Next slide, please. Oh. Next slide, yeah, there we go. So the important facets of my background are that the Section 57 Criminal Justice and Courts Act 2015, CPR 4416, and I've set out cases before 2005 and the cases afterwards. Next slide, please. Points of emphasis for section 57 is set out here, but you can see that um, what you need to have is a claimant that's entitled to damages in respect of the claim. Clearly, if it's a claim that's not successful, then this is not necessarily going to be relevant. Uh, and then there's an application by the defendant for dismissal of the claim because the claimant has been fundamentally dishonest. And it's on balance of probabilities. There's no criminal standard, so it's not beyond or reasonable doubt or anything else like that. It's on balance of probability. And it's in related to the primary claim or related claim. Now, that will be relevant when we talk about uh, costs and other such matters later on. But in general terms, it's, it's the claim for damages. Next slide, please. And you can see that uh, this is a, a, the court must dismiss the primary claim. Uh, unless it's satisfied that the claimant would suffer substantial injustice if the claim was dismissed. That substantial injustice doesn't necessarily involve you losing your damages if you're a claimant, uh, and, uh, um, but it depends on the particular circumstances. For example, whether somebody needs some damages to continue with uh, the care that they need for with a profound disability. Uh, there are different approaches taken in different cases. There's no one rule fits all for what is substantial injustice. Um, next slide, please. Um, just to emphasize that it it's, can be a claim where you've been honest in many aspects of it, but fundamentally dishonest in parts of it and aspects, and the whole claim can be dismissed. What the court has to do, because this is a, a, attempting to balance this sanction, is look at the amount of damages that the claimant would have recovered, uh, and when setting off from that, the... the uh, assessing the costs in the proceedings, 
that are due to the defendant because clocks will no longer apply. Um, the court has to look at the damage that the claimant would have been uh, awarded uh, and deduct those as a starting point from the damages, from the costs that are due to the defendant for the claim being dismissed. So it's a balanced sanction. Next slide, please. Uh, and you can see here that there's definitions of what is personal injury, uh, any impairment of the physical or mental condition, uh, and the related claim means uh, in connection with the same incident uh, and, and by the person other than the person who made the primary claim. But that's not usually in clinical negligence. This isn't a sort of multi-party road traffic collision. There's many of those cases uh, about uh, road traffic collisions. Um, when it says uh, related claim, that's not defined any further than that. And other related claims we'll hear about whether uh, you know, proceedings for costs are a related claim or not. And I'll discuss that later. Next slide, please. A cost sanction, 4416. That act means that it falls within the provision of 4416 to so the exemption to the qualified one-way cost shifting. Next slide, please. The cases before, I've outlined them. You can obviously look at them yourself. I haven't included the full uh, um, uh, citations because they're, they're available on, on many sources. Hunter and Butler, Cottrell, Newman and Folks, Cano and Gosling. Next slide, please. <clears throat> what does it really mean? What did Parliament envisage? Uh, and how have the courts interpreted what we're trying to address? Next slide, please. Um, beforehand, this is the, the Gosling cases. This is before the 2015 Act. And what the court, the, the Maloney here, the, the circuit judges, is, is saying is that it has to be interpreted purposefully in context. Um, uh, and what they're looking for is to distinguish between two levels of dishonesty. This is presaging what became the act. Uh, dishonesty in a peripheral matter, so that, that there shouldn't be any uh, effect or cost liability. And dishonesty which is fundamental, so it gives rise to a cost liability. Um, and this goes back to, again, what I was emphasising before, the holistic approach, looking at everything in the round, uh, making a decision about whether the dishonesty is fundamental rather than some per per peripheral collateral matter. Next slide, please. Um, and they tried to, to define fundamental as opposed to incidence, incidental or collateral. Uh, and this is the first exposition about the dishonesty going to the root of the whole of the claim or a substantial part of the claim. Uh, and the substantial part of the claim can be uh, a significant head of damage or actually just a head of damage that might in other cases not be significant but actually might be a large claim such as one of the cases as a gardening claim where it turned out that the person had a gardener beforehand but was claiming for an enormous amount of, of gardening fees uh, on the basis that there wasn't a gardener in place already and that was found to be a substantial uh, part of the claim and a fundamentally dishonest. Next slide please. What did Parliament intend? Well, here we go, citing our, our barren folks, uh, emphasising again the same point, that claims involving a bit of lying and fraud, it should only be imposed this sanction when it goes to the heart of the claim, the root of, of, of the claim. There's that emphasis on the, the gravity of it. Next slide, please. These are the cases afterwards that we will go through. Thompson, Barber, Ivy, Howlett. The <coughs> The London Organising Committee of the, of the, the Paralympic and Olympic Games, uh, Sinfield, what is known as normally, Wright and McDade. There are other cases, I'll provide you with the next slide please, uh, and these are just a sort of easy access database to the relevant cases. Uh, Spencer Smith, Hyder, Roberts, Craig uh, and Webb West and then the Kassim. Kassim's a, a, an interesting case that we'll, we'll uh, look at in a little bit more. It, it's quite recent and it's a matter with regard to a part 36 payment that was accepted. Next slide please. There are some other cases. Um, these are mostly PI cases but the interesting thing about them is you'll see uh, Mr Justice Spencer coming through. He's obviously been the person that seems to have been allocated or tasked with dealing with the, the principles that are applicable to these cases and one of the things just to emphasize is it's said again and again that there is sort of What's the best word for it? Some judicial scepticism about whiplash cases in any event. Uh, and the, that, that scepticism is coming through and there's been a willingness for the QBD to listen to appeals and find in favour of uh, the uh, appellants uh, and making some fairly onerous strictures on 
whiplash claims and the way they're prosecuted. And you can see the, the usual ones are Melody, AXA, Liverpool and Garraway. Garraway is interesting in the sense that it's, it's a county court case, but what happens in that judgment is that the court sets out um, and praises the, the assiduous nature of the preparation uh, by the defendant's solicitors that was all the way through the proceedings preparing the witness statements expert reports when they had these suspicions uh, and then including surveillance that, that was confirming those matters. So it, Garraway's an interesting read just because it's an approach that is detailed and set out and, and, and gives some structure so it's probably worth just a, a cursory read at some point. Next slide please. Um, I just emphasise the, the, these cases with a little bit about each one. Um, Thompson, we've got a, a wasted cost order made eventually against the solicitor, which um, must have come as a bit of a shock. So it's not just the claim found to be fundamentally dishonest, but a, a collateral matter, a wasted cost order, because the solicitor failed to send the CCTV evidence to the medical expert and other matters when the particulars of claim uh, was being drafted. So it, it's a sanction for not just the claimant being fundamentally dishonest, but the claimant's legal advisors not doing what's proper in the circumstances. Next slide, please. Barber uh, emphasised the general rule that the unsuccessful claimant should be ordered to pay at the costs. Um, this was a dishonest claim for loss of earnings. Um, there was no reason to, to say that there was going to cost him substantial uh, problems uh, therefore the, uh, the cost uh, liability could be imposed uh, and it was fair and just to permit half of his costs to be enforced against the claimant so there's an element there of <clears throat> not just looking at uh, whether there should be all of the costs removed but actually what in the circumstances is the appropriate proportion if not all of them the sting in the tail was it wasn't just half the cost but they were on an indemnity basis next slide please uh, Ivy, this is about looking to the state of mind of the claimant and, and this is important because uh, the question is, is whether the, the actual state of, of mind or belief to the facts, whether he thought that he was uh, swimming in the pool when he said he couldn't do anything. Um, it, it, it's a, the belief that must be reasonable and whether it's genuinely held. Now, there are some cases where you, it's obvious in the facts that it can't have been reasonable and genuinely held, but there are other matters where the, to the state of disability or whether you think you could list something or something else like that. One has to look at it through the lens of whether it's reasonably held uh, and, and whether it's genuinely held. Um, next slide, please. Uh, as far as the fraud, the dishonesty aspect, um, what happens is that in other cases that are not covered by fundamental dishonesty, let's say arguments about a bill of shipping or lading or something else like that, if you're going to, to allege fraud, generally what you have to do is you have to plead fraud and it has to be <clears throat> more explicitly set out and the, the court has to see what, what's being alleged as far as that fraud is concerned. But in fundamental dishonesty, the key is the facts or are the facts. So the facts that the defendant is going to be inviting the judge to draw the inference that he was fundamentally dishonest, for example, by not suffering the injuries that have been asserted. So it's facts, facts and facts. There doesn't have to be fundamentally dishonest written in large writing or uh, a heading in your defence saying we're going to allege fundamental dishonesty, but the facts must be there. Next slide, please. Um, not just the facts, but uh, not every case, but I think the requirement to, to cross-examine, it means that, that the facts that are there in the defence or in the, the, the claimant's statement, they have to be tested and it has to be questions about them. You, you can't just say at the very last minute in the, the last paragraph of your closing that we think this is fundamentally dishonest without testing and challenging those facts. You don't have to say you're being dishonest or, or you're lying or anything similar, but they have to be given an opportunity to meet the case that's going to be coming of fundamental dishonesty. So next slide please. Um, what we've got here is Sinfield. Um, 
the facts that are relevant there in the fundamentalist honesty was that they were ones that were affecting the presentation of the case either in respect to either liability or quantum and those are the matters that have to be challenged they found it in that particular case that they were premeditated and maintained over many months and it wasn't until the, the true picture was brought out by the defendant solicitor that those were highlighted and it was quite clear that it was dishonest and premeditated next slide please what we've also got is a contrast and I, I, I produce right in the next case just to say that it doesn't always go <clears throat> the way you think it might go there's an exaggeration of a care claim it got 2,000 instead of 73,000 um, but what the court found was that he wasn't being dishonest fundamentally or otherwise what was happening he was just um, he wasn't aware of how much was being claimed he wasn't aware that uh, what he was suggesting was subjectively what he thought but it wasn't really something standing back that could be objectively held the need for all of that care I can understand how a court can be sympathetic but the other difficulty I have with this is that it, it, it seems to introduce a bit more subjectivity rather than the objectivity that's uh, emphasized in so many other cases but it, it's worth looking at just to see what might happen if one as a solicitor a defendant solicitor you don't have enough focus and detail uh, and uh, allow your experts and inform your experts that that's the suspicion you have so that he can be asked about things such as exaggerated care claims or exaggerated disability at the early stages of, of expert evidence next slide please <clears throat> this is another one somebody who uh, fell into a hole and injured his ankle uh, and the, the court found there'd been a degree of overstatement of his pain and the effect on him uh, and he'd all engaged in conduct that was to convince the experts rather than deceive the medical witnesses now again this is an element of subjectivity um it, you know it is as it is but it's it's worth looking at the case because he managed to convince the court that there was um it was deployed to, to convince of the, the, the injury that he'd suffered how, how bad it was rather than some deliberate deceit one has to again go back to looking at the the, the garraway cases i emphasize a quick read just to see how setting out the careful construction of a fundamental dishonesty claim is required next slide please Ida, uh, this is one that um it is it's slightly different in the sense that um what happened is that the 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 judge stepped back from it in the, in the first instance and really didn't address the matter the appeal to the, the high court did look at that uh, and the court formed the view <clears throat> stepping back from it, it was plainly dishonest and there was no basis never mind the claimant but there's no basis on what the judge could properly have concluded that he was simply confused so what we've got is, is two sides of the ring here the qb having the, the the determination to look at something and say that's plainly dishonest i don't care what the excuses are as opposed to the judges of first instance be, being a little bit in circumstances uh, either not prepared or ill prepared to, to make those findings next slide please this is a, a, another one looking at another strand of the, of the holistic assessment <clears throat> it, it's dishonest information about of a vehicle a value claim that was provided by a claimant as part of the proceedings and looking at it in in the round this wasn't a minor or peripheral part of the claim it, it was uh, an important part of it um, and therefore it was dishonest yes was it fundamental yes because it wasn't just a small collateral non-fundamental part uh, and these are the sort of grainy details that you have to go into and the judgments that you have to make next slide please this is uh, another one from the Queen Prevention Division, Peg, uh, Peg and Webb. Um, genuine collision, but dishonesty in the presentation of the soft tissue injuries uh, and failed to tell the medical experts about a quad bike later. Uh, and even though the damages were just about pain, suffering and loss of amenity, the work of the solicitors, looking at the records, comparing the timing of the different events, teasing out the fact that there'd been another collision or a quad by accident and then making sure that the medical experts were properly informed about this and they were aware of that timeline 
that persuaded the court that there were fundamental dishonesty uh, and 70% of the costs were, were ordered. Next slide, please. Um, I, I set out the, the molecular aspects of, of the PEG case. It's worth looking at, but this is something where a part of it has to be the decision making about how much time are you going to spend, what evidence are you going to get, uh, and what are the consequences you're going to seek. Uh, and Ella will be developing those aspects further in due course. But it's not just FD, you've got to look at the integers of it as well. Next slide, please. Um, final bit of warning. <clears throat> the, the cases aren't necessarily over uh, until the finding is made by the court. So you have to construct this, you have to have some forethought. And this is emphasizing the structure uh, and place of it. Disclosure, uh, looking at the different stages, the witness statement, uh, and, and don't forget the case management conference. Looking at costs, which we can talk about in just a minute, but, but also looking at the directions that are going to be made and how you're going to address any aspects of the evidence to point towards fundamental dishonesty at each stage. Next slide, please. Cost proceedings. Now, um, there isn't any authority on this yet. Um, there, there is the, the case that I mentioned of Kasim, which is to do with a Part 36 offer that was accepted uh, via whistleblowers. I don't know what it was, work colleagues of Mr. Kasim at, at the hospital he worked at. I think probably said, oh, we saw him running to the pub on a regular basis or something similar to that. They whistleblowed on him after he'd accepted the Part 36. Uh, and the court uh, was faced with an application after the, the money had been paid over to have the money paid back and to have a cost sanction. And in the end, in the Kasim case, the court agreed and went with that because the evidence that he had been uh, fundamentally dishonest and exaggerating was clear. Now, as far as cost proceedings, um, Ella and I differ on this, but that there's, there's no uh, authority yet. And my view is that when the costs belong to the client uh, and the assessment continues on, even the lawyers benefit from the costs, as, as do the, 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 the claimants if their costs are paid. Um, I think it's at least arguable, very arguable, that the fundamental dishonesty can be applied to the whole of the claim, and that includes the assessments of costs. Would it cause substantial injustice to deprive a dishonest claimant, claiming a whole range of costs that it never incurred? Well, I, I don't see that that would be substantial injustice if you're clearly claiming something that you've never incurred. Um, well, what was the effect though of that fundamental dishonesty? Is it just to dismiss the costs? Or would it be to give the court the power to disallow all of the claimant's costs, just as if it had been an exaggeration in the, in the damages that were being claimed? Again, I think under the, you know, the section 57, the court's got a very wide discretion in relation to the costs. Uh, and uh, uh, I have the view that I think it would be reasonable to be seeking uh, fundamental dishonesty uh, proceedings e even if it's after the claim has been settled uh, and the damages have been paid over uh, and at a later stage you're looking at a, a fraudulent bill of costs we know from the Cassian case that the court will entertain a subsequent application for matters that have supposedly already been been done and dusted next slide please that's my roundup my canter through the the basic matters those cases are, are worth a look at if you've got a a quiet evening and, and maybe a glass of something or whatever just to familiarize yourself because being aware of what has and hasn't been emphasized in the principles are important practical considerations for the now the, the more sophisticated and, and focused aspects of what to do in the claims thank you over to ella Thank you, David. Um, yes, so now that we know and we're comfortable with what fundamental dishonesty is and how the courts have approached it in some previous cases, I just want to look at some practical considerations for cases that you might have, how you consider and factor in fundamental dishonesty through the lifetime of a case, um, with a particular emphasis, of course, on clinical negligence cases. The first point I wanted to make is that um, you shouldn't think of fundamental dishonesty as being confined to exaggeration cases in clinical negligence. Um, an important aspect of clinical negligence cases is that obviously often liability tends to turn on disputed expert evidence, questions of medical causation, but the basic factual background is largely agreed. There might be some quibbles about the accuracy of records or that sort of thing, but often there will be agreement about what surgery was performed, 
what injury has been suffered and the case is turning on the, the medical view as to whether that was appropriate treatment or whether that treatment has contributed to the injury that's been suffered. So that's why we tend to think of fundamental dishonesty as being confined to exaggeration of large heads of loss in clinical negligence claims. But if you do have a case where there is a fundamental dispute of fact, uh, I would advise you to consider why. And if the court rejects the claimant's account on that fundamental dispute of fact, is it because they were just wrong? Or is there the reason that their evidence has been rejected explained by dishonesty? So an example of a sort of honest mistake uh, is, for, for example, in uh, consent cases, where very often you will have a claimant who will say, if I had been advised differently, I would not have undergone this treatment. Uh, and there are many cases where the court has rejected that evidence, but they've done so in the main by finding that the claimant has effectively looked back through the prism of what has happened to them. They have honestly convinced themselves that they would have acted differently, but the court doesn't accept that. That's not a case where you're going to have any sort of luck with findings of fundamental dishonesty. But there are examples of cases in clinical negligence where there is a dispute of fact which is fundamental to the claim uh, and where the claimant um, being wrong about that issue of fact can't be explained other than by dishonesty. Uh, I had a case where we did in fact, although as David says you don't have to, we did plead fundamental dishonesty in our defence, uh, where the claimant had, uh, his whole claim was that he hadn't had surgery within um, the appropriate period, the waiting time that he should have had it within, um, and alleged a, a substantial delay of well over a year. However, we had documentary evidence of him having been offered the appointment uh, or preoperative appointment within the appropriate waiting list time and having phoned up and said, I want to delay my surgery until next year. Now, now that alone again might not have been enough to establish fundamental dishonesty saves that the claimant had given a detailed account of phoning up, writing letters, chasing up this surgery that he said had never been offered um, and which very clearly had been offered to him. So that's the sort of case where you might think that um, there is a sufficient dispute on the on liability or on the facts to raise fundamental dishonesty. Uh, another example is the case of Resumus in the Ministry of Justice. That claim failed for any number of reasons that aren't relevant to um, the discussion today. Um, including whether or not the Ministry of Justice was in fact liable for the claimant's medical care. Uh, but the claimant in that case was, uh, for large periods of time, a prisoner, uh, raising issues about the care that he received in prison. Uh, but the, an issue raised by the defendant was that his failure to seek medical attention during a period where he was not in prison uh, was an intervening act that broke the chain of causation. The claimant responded to that saying that he had in fact sought medical attention and had had an appointment with a GP, but was unable to produce any evidence of that GP appointment, um, which obviously is quite surprising given that these things are always recorded and it shouldn't be diff a difficult matter to evidence. Uh, the judge therefore um, rejected the claim that he had um, sought medical attention during that period when he wasn't a prisoner, uh, and given that if he had been correct about that, that might have been enough to found liability against the defendant. That was held to be a, a matter that was fundamental to the claim. Uh, and therefore, had the claim not failed for other reasons, it would have been dismissed pursuant to section 57. Uh, and indeed, the judge in that case again went on to consider whether there was substantial injustice and found that there wouldn't have been. Uh, I just wanted to cover some evidence to look for in these cases. Some of it will be fairly obvious, but uh, I think it's, uh, there were some important issues to consider. So first of all, look in the medical records for details of previous solicitors' requests for records. If, as a defendant, you find that other solicitors have been requesting GP records, for example, seek disclosure, um, not just of that letter requesting the records, but of any pleadings, medical reports, uh, the outcome of that previous case. Uh, and sometimes, in my experience, Claimants have responded to those sorts of requests saying, well, there's no prospect of double recovery because that previous claim, there was no settlement, it didn't receive judgment, so there's no double recovery. That, I would suggest, is not the end of the inquiry, though, because just because the claimant didn't recover damages doesn't mean that that previous claim doesn't undermine or couldn't undermine the existing claim. For example, if you have a clinical negligence claim with a large loss of earnings claim, 
but two years before the clinical incident, the claimant was involved in a road traffic accident and brought a claim saying that as a result of injuries sustained in that, they would never work again. That that inconsistency undermines the claim that's being brought in your clinical negligence claim. Uh, medical records should also tell you whether or not the claimant has pre-existing or unrelated comorbidities which have been downplayed. So if the claimant has, for example, gone to a medical expert um, and been asked about their pre-existing medical history uh, and downplayed the extent of the difficulties they would have had but for the injuries uh, involved in the claim, that, that will undermine their account. DWP records are a particularly um, useful source um, of information about what the claimant has told other people about their abilities. Personal independence payment applications in particular ask questions about cooking, preparing meals, washing, dressing, mobilising, exactly the sorts of things that a claimant is likely to have given evidence about in support of any claim for care or mobility aids or those sorts of matters. So cross-refer those. Um, again, whichever party you're acting for, make sure you've done that cross-referring and you know what is in there. Social media is um, a very important um, potential source of information uh, and has been used successfully to defeat claims, even in cases that have led to the dismissal, uh, sorry, led to committal of the claimant following the claim. But there are just two things that I want to emphasize, uh, two points of caution about social media. First of all, look for evidence of when a photograph has been post, uh, sorry, taken rather than posted. A claimant may well have posted a picture during a period where they say they were suffering from injury that is inconsistent with that injury. But if it turns out it was taken two years previously, it's of no assistance to any uh, attempt for, for a finding of fundamental dishonesty. The other slightly subtler point uh, is that I think it is important to bear in mind that for most people, their social media is a carefully curated impression um, of their life. They want to be able to put forward a version of their life which is attractive, um, but may not reflect the reality. Uh, so carefully also consider whether or not a photograph that you found, for example, posted on social media really undermines their claim. You might find a picture of a claimant in the bar, which gives the impression that they're going out every night of the week and having and partying and that sort of thing, which would be inconsistent with their claim. But if on closer analysis, actually, every three months, you find one picture of a claimant sat with a drink at about eight o'clock, does that actually undermine their claim? It might not. So just be a bit careful if the initial impression when you glance at social media of someone's life looks inconsistent look at the detail and cross refer again back to your other evidence. Uh, surveillance is a topic that we could probably fill a webinar with all by, on its own. So I'm just going to very briefly recap some of the key principles uh, before looking at what I think are perhaps some of the limitations of surveillance evidence. Um, so the first thing to bear in mind is that surveillance is a privileged document. That means that if a defendant has already obtained it for the purposes of the litigation, they do not have to put it on their disclosure list. Um, but the claimant must be given a fair opportunity to deal with it. So if a defendant doesn't want to disclose it at the disclosure stage, if they're going to rely upon it, they are going to have to give the claimant a fair opportunity to deal with it, which means not ambushing the claimant with it, um, say two weeks before trial, serving surveillance evidence at that point and expecting to be allowed to rely upon it. Uh, the defendant is, however, entitled to wait until a claimant nails um, their colours to the mast. So, for example, until a claimant has served a witness statement for trial, uh, or in some cases it may be appropriate to wait until a claimant has served a schedule of loss. Both of those, of course, documents which are supported by a statement of truth. Uh, and then serving um, your surveillance evidence. Uh, it, it's a question of judgment in every case when the appropriate time is. There is further guidance in the cases on this slide. As I say, to, to talk through all of that guidance um, would probably fill its own webinar. The only other point I wanted to flag that arises from those cases is uh, you have to be alive to issues about when and whether to show surveillance footage to experts. Um, my, my very rough and ready suggestion would be not to do it unless and until you've got an order or agreement to do so, because the risk you take, of course, is you show surveillance footage to an expert 
the court refuses to admit it uh, and then you have an expert who has to try to give evidence putting that surveillance footage out of their mind or, or if they can't you're unable to rely upon that expert it can very quickly um, becomes quite complicated if you do that um, but for anyone interested in surveillance those are the cases that i would suggest uh, that you take a look at for now i just wanted to concentrate on its limitations um, and that is not because uh, i don't think it's a very powerful tool in appropriate cases again it has been used to support findings of fundamental dishonesty even cases that have led to committals for contempt of court but it's not the appropriate tool for every case uh, and you do need to think about your case before seeking surveillance footage so for example if you have a claimant who is already or separately very disabled uh, and there is no dispute between the parties your experts all agree that that claimant has a very low quality of life either for due to um, the consequences of the index in incident or for some other unrelated reason you're not going to catch anything on surveillance that is going to be irrelevant so you may have for example a situation where you think uh, that the claimant is exaggerating the impact uh, of their negligence related injury on their life but if their life was already severely impacted by disability surveillance isn't going to help you with that uh, similarly exaggerated claims for future deterioration or disability are probably not suitable claims for surveillance um, you might have a case uh, as i did recently where you're served with a, a very very large schedule of loss um, you're concerned about the potential inflation of future heads of loss but they all relate to a predicted future deterioration and um, for example where there is a prediction of future surgery that is going to lead to the claimant's uh, condition deteriorating in those cases again all you can do is surveil the claimant in their condition as they are now and if their case is that their life is not significantly affected now but will be in the future surveillance is again not really the correct tool for you uh, and a takeaway i would say for both those acting for claimants and defendants uh, in relation to surveillance uh, is that it's important once you receive surveillance footage to consider whether it is actually inconsistent with the claimant's account friends life limited and miley the Court of Appeal decision, it actually arises out of uh, an income protection insurance plan. The uh, defendant in that case had chronic fatigue syndrome. Uh, he made a claim under his employer's income protection insurance, which was initially accepted, but after time the insurer uh, became sceptical about the extent of his disability and whether or not he really couldn't work. So they commissioned surveillance. Uh, and there are two interesting points uh, that the judge made in respect of the surveillance that was served um, in, in rejecting the insurer's claim. The first of those points is that the, uh, the insurer made a submission that the surveillance only showed good days. Um, they said this claimant claimed to have good days and bad days, but you can see from the surveillance that actually all his days are good days and the claim of good days and bad days is, is wrong. But the judge rejected that submission and said well on the bad days the claimant doesn't leave his house so of course you haven't got any surveillance of those days that the surveillance will only ever catch the good days uh, and further the, the second point is that the judge stood back from the surveillance footage and compared it to a daily diary that the claimant was keeping of his activity and his ability and said when one compared the two they were actually broadly consistent so again this is an example that is going to crop up uh, through everything i say today of the importance of looking at the detail just because you have some footage that perhaps shows that claimant walking around living what appears to be a normal life it does not mean that it is in any way inconsistent uh, with the account that the claimant's given you, you need to look at what the claimant has said they can and cannot do and compare that to the surveillance and see whether or not the surveillance is actually inconsistent with that account A question that is always difficult is when to raise fundamental dishonesty. Um, we've seen from the Howlett and Davis case that David talked about uh, that there is no requirement to plead fundamental dishonesty in a defence. But if you're acting for a defendant, you are going to have to think still about how and when you are going to put the claimant on notice that you think the claim is dishonest. 
as I say, in those cases where there is perhaps some sort of dispute of fact going to liability, probably the defence will be the, the appropriate time to raise it. Uh, the, another option is in the counter schedule. So if you are, for example, served uh, with an extremely, or what you believe to be an extremely inflated schedule of loss, that might be the time, particularly because by then you should also have finalised expert evidence, a signed witness statement, to serve a counter schedule saying this is what we think uh, your claim is worth uh, on an honest basis, uh, and these are all the ways in which we think that the losses claimed are dishonest. If you haven't done that, uh, I would suggest that in any case where the finding of fundamental dishonesty is something you are foreseeably going to be applying for, you should at least raise it in uh, some sort of correspondence. Often I see that done where, for example, a defendant will make an offer to drop hands uh, and will state in that letter that if that offer is not accepted, fundamental dishonesty is a matter that will be pursued at trial. I, I do think if you think it's a, an issue in your case, you should aim to put the claimant on notice before trial. But the absolute latest you should do it is cross-examination. Um, we had a question that came in before this webinar uh, saying, what are the implications of not putting dishonesty allegations directly to a claimant, but putting them in closing submissions? Um, well, well, the implication is you can't, you, you will not be able to put that uh, allegation in closing submissions if you haven't at the very latest put it in cross-examination. Uh, there will be cases where the issue of fundamental dishonesty only arises in the claimant's cross-examination. The claimant might give an answer uh, which suddenly puts dishonesty in an issue where it might never have been before. Uh, I'd suggest they would be quite rare, uh, but it could happen. Uh, and the issue then is that, again, the cross-examiner needs to make sure that they have explored that issue with the claimant in detail, have put to them anything that they would want to be able to put in closing submissions. Uh, and the lesson for claimants to take away from this uh, is that even if it, fundamental dishonesty has not been pleaded, throughout the lifetime of your claim, you should scrutinise it uh, with the same care that the defendant would it's not safe to assume that because the matter hasn't been pleaded that it won't arise. So at every stage of the claim, consider are there inconsistencies. If you've been served with a medical report, uh, either from your own expert or from the defendant's expert, check it again against previous medical reports, previous accounts that the claimant has given. Consider whether there are inconsistencies. If there are, consider whether there's an explanation and also consider whether or not it's appropriate to preempt the issue arising by giving that explanation. Um, the obvious place to do that would be in a witness statement uh, if you've not yet served those. If you can identify a potential inconsistency that has a clear and honest explanation, um, then why not give it at that stage? Uh, but we've also been asked several questions about uh, when fundamental dishonesty can be raised uh, either after settlement uh, or after judgment. Uh, and the first place I would suggest to look in that respect is Practice Direction 44 and Paragraph 12.4, which says a Paragraph B in respect of settlement that where the proceedings have been settled, the court will not save in exceptional circumstances order that issues arising out of an allegation that the claim is fundamentally dishonest to be determined in those proceedings. But perhaps more helpfully in respect of discontinuance, continues at paragraph C, where the claimant has served a notice of discontinuance, the court may direct that issues arising out of an allegation that the claim is fundamentally dishonest be determined, notwithstanding that the notice has not been set aside pursuant to rule 28.4. So if you're acting for a defendant, you don't need to take the step of setting aside the notice of discontinuance. Um, that's not a straightforward step and it's not without risk. You can simply ask the court to determine the issue of fundamental dishonesty. What that also means is that if you're acting for a claimant, uh, you need to be careful uh, in assuming that discontinuing will make the issue of fundamental dishonesty go away. It might not. So the safest thing always if possible is to agree some form of settlement, some sort of drop hand settlement. Uh, ideally, if the issue is sufficiently relevant uh, with some sort of express agreement that the defendant will not pursue fundamental dishonesty further. Fundamental dishonesty can also be pursued after settlement. It's done by way of the defendant bringing their own claim in deceit. Hayward and Zurich Insurance Company uh, is a case that was considered by the Supreme Court. 
And the issue that went to the Supreme Court was whether or not the defendant um, could be said to have been induced by the claimant's uh, dishonesty into the settlement. Because unless they had, of course, the claim and deceit um, fails. And the claimant said, well, you weren't induced by my dishonesty because you never believed my claim was honest. Uh, but what the Supreme Court said about that was that the defendant does not have to have believed the claimant's dishonest representation, their dishonest case, to have been induced by it. They may have been induced by the belief that the claimant would put that dishonest representation before a judge and the judge would accept it. So the fact that the defendant had settled the case to avoid the risk of it going before the judge uh, and being found to be honest did not mean that they hadn't been induced by the claimant's dishonesty. Uh, Kassam is an interesting case uh, which David has talked about a little bit. There were just two points that I wanted to raise uh, coming out of Kassam. Uh, that High Court reference I've given you there is the appeal um, of an issue that related to pleading in, in this case. Uh, and there was an earlier issue that arose below, which I think is quite interesting, where uh, the defendant was forced to amend their pleadings to acknowledge and accept that if their claim and rescission of the settlement was succeeded, that the effect would be that the Part 36 settlement is rescinded and then technically the claimant, of course, is at liberty to continue to litigate the claim, albeit that would only arise in circumstances where the settlement had been rescinded for dishonesty. So it's a little bit difficult to see how the claimant will continue to litigate at that point. But the second point, which I think is even more important, is that we've already seen that a defendant to a claim who believes that claim to be fundamentally dishonest does not have to plead a detailed fraud um, pleading. They need to plead the facts, but, but there's a much less onerous obligation on them in terms of pleading. A defendant who brings a claim in deceit, however, is effectively bringing a claim that the, uh, that the uh, personal injury claim was dishonest uh, and they need to set out for that common law claim in deceit a full pleading in fraud and all the matters that they rely upon to establish that there has been fraud uh, and that was the issue that went uh, on appeal it was uh, the uh, in that case there was concern that the details of fraud had not been pleaded adequately one of the questions we had that I thought was very interesting is what about um, raising fundamental dishonesty after judgment? Now, it, it's relatively straightforward if, for example, a claim has resolved, um, there was a judgment, um, and later, for example, the defendant finds out that that judgment was obtained in some way by dishonesty. But the High Court has an inherent jurisdiction and the County Court has a statutory jurisdiction to set aside that judgment where the judgment can be shown to have been obtained by fraud. But this got me thinking about a situation which must arise in a lot of clinical negligence cases where a defendant has, for example, admitted breach of duty uh, and admitted that that breach of duty has caused some loss, although uh, the quantum and the full causation are an issue. Uh, in that circumstance, uh, the likelihood is that a judgment will be entered, perhaps at CCMC stage, for an amount to be determined. Uh, so what happens then? If the claimant is found at the quantum trial to have been found to be to have been fundamentally dishonest, if they have, for example, uh, got one of those inflated heads of loss, such as the gardening claim in Sinfield, section fifty-seven has the effect at that point of requiring the judge to strike out the claim, uh, as we've seen. But what happens to the fact that there has already been a judgment been entered? Um, could that judgment be said to have been obtained by fraud? I don't think it probably could really because the judgment was on the basis of breach of duty uh, and causation of some loss. Those matters aren't related to the fraud. The fraud is the exaggerated uh, claim for loss. My view probably is that the court can simply set aside uh, the judgment pursuant to CPR 3.17 but for anyone who is interested on this um, there is a, a lengthy uh, discussion of the powers of a court to set aside a final order pursuant to CPR 3.17 in the White Book at paragraph 3.1.17.2. Uh, and effectively the conclusion of that uh, section of commentary is that it's not yet clear what the extent of the powers of CPR 3.17 are. This issue, to my knowledge, hasn't yet been litigated. Uh, the circumstances certainly would have to be exceptional for the power to be used to, to set aside a final order. My view is that the likelihood is, is that the power could be used in that way. And certainly, I think in any circumstance where you've already persuaded a judge 
that there has been fundamental dishonesty. Uh, as long as the judge accepts they have a power, uh, I wouldn't have thought there'd be any difficulty in them persuading the judge to exercise that power, simply to set aside the earlier judgment uh, and strike out the claim pursuant to section 57. Obviously, we know the main consequence of a finding of fundamental dishonesty is the disapplication of quarks and it enables a defendant to recover their costs when they wouldn't ordinarily be able to. But of course, it does also lead to the possibility of a committal for contempt of court. Uh, and that has happened in the two clinical negligence cases that I've cited there. Uh, and what this underlines, I would suggest, is the importance for anyone, of anyone acting for a claimant uh, considering the issue of fundamental dishonesty the whole way through. There is obviously a limit to what one can properly do. You cannot coach your client on how to get away with a fraud, um, but you can be alive to the issue. Uh, and what I would suggest that involves is checking and rechecking, and more importantly, ensuring that the cl client has checked and rechecked every account before documents are served. So checking a medical report, checking that the client agrees, uh, that the expert has correctly recorded what was told them uh, told to them before that medical report is served because the last thing you want to do of course is be the one that's in, uh, introduced any inconsistencies into the case uh, but of course it is right to note that uh, contempt uh, must be proved to the criminal standard that is of course beyond reasonable doubt as opposed to the civil standard on the balance of probabilities so a defendant may well prove fundamental dishonesty on the balance of probabilities, but shouldn't assume that they will automatically be able to go on and apply uh, for permission for uh, committal proceedings uh, because they may not be able to prove the same dishonesty to the criminal standard. Uh, so just some key takeaways that I think apply to anybody acting in these cases, whether for claimants or defendants. The first thing is, to, I think everybody uh, in these cases has to master the detail. That means cross-referencing every account, uh, every document, spotting where there are inconsistencies uh, and being alive to those inconsistencies when they arise. But although this issue is very detail-oriented, uh, I do think that both parties, again, have to consider other explanations when they find inconsistencies is the only explanation for the inconsistency dishonesty or is there something else? Some claimants are just bad historians. Um, they may have a psychiatric injury that you may be dealing with a claimant with um, some sort of brain injury who's taking strong medication. They may just be someone who's not very good at the detail themselves. Um, and I think what's important is whether you're acting for a claimant or a defendant once you've found those inconsistencies to take a step back, to look at the nature of them, the number of them, and consider whether they really do demonstrate uh, that this is a case uh, that's dishonest uh, or a case where there are simply mistakes. So that is everything from me. Um, I think we have covered the questions that were raised in advance, but if we haven't, then please those questioners um, flag to us that we haven't. Uh, I haven't seen while I've been talking whether we've had any dealt with in the Q&A. Let's have a look. I've, I've dealt with uh, some of the, there's just a, the last one I've dealt with from Isabel about have we got a, a case where there's been pre-existing conditions uh, that have been uh, not mentioned, perhaps downplayed, uh, and subsequently there has been uh, a finding of fundamental dishonesty but by the court. Um, I've got to say that I, I can't think of one where that was entirely clear. There is the, the quad bike case where there was a sort of subsequent matter condition that appeared with a road traffic accident prior to that. Um, but I'll have a look and I'll get back to, to Isabel and see if I can find a case that clearly sets out a pre-existing condition that was downplayed or obscured or hidden that was becoming apparent or didn't become apparent at a later stage in the clinical negligence proceedings. I certainly, I'm not aware of any reported clinical negligence cases where that's happened. The Melody case might be interesting because that was a case where there was a failure to mention previous accidents, which obviously is relevant to potential previous injuries. Yeah. Uh, and I've certainly had cases, uh, personal injury cases, arising out of road traffic accidents, where a party has been claiming whiplash but hasn't then 
um, been honest about previous back injuries or previous neck injuries where they've been found to be fundamentally dishonest. So it's something that the courts certainly can do and have done. Yeah, yeah. But I'm similarly not familiar with a reported clinical negligence yeah. case. I mean, I've had a, a recent case that just as an example that of course didn't come to, to a judgment. Well, I was for um, the orthopedic surgeon who was in that particular case acting in a private capacity. Uh, and he, he managed to operate on somebody's uh, bunion um, to do a hallux uh, metatarsal osteotomy uh, and used a rather old fashioned procedure without an internal fixation screw. The problem was that the, the, the woman claimant was at a BMI of nearly 40, which was in the grossly obese situation, and also was uh, a long time sufferer of fibromyalgia. Uh, palpitations, a whole range of, of other conditions, which the psychiatrists for the defendant thought was a, a, a somatic disorder uh, or somatic symptom disorder. Uh, and what happened in those particular circumstances were that there were extensive clinical records. She said that the fact that the bunion surgery hadn't gone well and had slipped and distorted because a screw hadn't been put in the osteotomy, that that made her hip pains, back pains, uh, shortness of breath and aggravated her general condition. Um, but in particular, because there'd been an altered gait and chronic pain, it had uh, aggravated over time different aspects of a musculoskeletal condition, her shortness of breath and, and other such matters. Now, the, the difficulty with that was that there was such a panoply of previous conditions that um, it was almost impossible to pick out but what had happened uh, and what had exactly been aggra aggravated by what turned out to be uh, deficient and, and improperly performed surgery because there should have been a screw put in. Um, that's the, the nature of pre-existing conditions. Uh, as, as Isabel says, there's a, uh, a need to dissect out what there is before and after. I often find, and I've done a number of those sort of cases, that it's hard to pick out of that often range of pre-existing conditions uh, a sufficiently clear evidence of dishonesty and clear exaggeration to amount to fundamental dishonesty, particularly when you take a holistic approach that is being emphasised. So you find in clinical negligence cases it's rare to have the pre-existing solitary condition that has been downplayed or not mentioned, um, unlike the road traffic claims which is often to do with previous accidents or previous back pains or something like that. So. I don't know of any decided case that I've seen that involves a pre-existing condition in a clinical negligence context and a fundamental dishonesty. And I've looked at a number of aspects of this case law, but I'll have another look and I'll get back to Isabel and see if I can find something just to assist with that. I have just another couple of questions coming in. So Mark Shepherd asks, where would a party be advised to pursue committal proceedings rather than just obtaining judgment, disapplying quacks and claiming costs? Um, well, what I would say to that is that they're not alternatives. So the first step always is obtain judgment, disapply quacks and claim costs. If you've been successful with that, that's the point to step back and consider whether or not um, it's appropriate also to go forward and pursue committal proceedings. Um, and as I say, that won't be every case where you've had a finding of fundamental dishonesty because of the higher burden of proof. Uh, and because obviously those proceedings again involve incurring further expense, so I think in any case where you've managed to disapply quarks, you've recovered your costs, that's the point to take a long, hard look at the case and consider whether or not uh, you actually have decent prospects of establishing uh, the criminal standard of proof and whether co commencing new proceedings at that stage is worthwhile. I don't know, David, if you have any other thoughts on that? But other than the fact that whether it's committal proceedings or not, one can suggest those to the court and seek the, the courts uh, to, to move that on. But uh, beyond that, uh, realistically, for, for, the, for the defendant, it's not really going to be within the, 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 the defendant's gift, really. It depends on, on what the court is prepared to do in the court's view of it. Uh, and that, I think, will depend on the particular facts and whether the, the, the court is of the view that it warrants a, a referral. I have to say that there's an increasing number of referrals for uh, assessment for committal proceedings um it seems something that the courts are more prepared to do but as you say that this is 
you know, it's not a either or. It, it's something that runs subsequent and in parallel to other aspects of, of the FD claim. Uh, and then Gary Warner asks, the fundamentally dishonest claimant is also a breach of the terms of their CFA uh, and find, will find that they will also be responsible for their own costs in addition to those of the defendants. Uh, it's a risk claimant solicitors need to take into account as in reality they are unlikely to be paid. Um, and yes, absolutely, I agree. That that's precisely why um, I've tried to ad address this to both parties because it is something that claimant solicitors need to be alive to just as much as defendant solicitors. Yeah. Uh, and it's not just the fact that they might not get their costs. That there is that there's a case that I mentioned about the wasted costs order. If the court finds not just that the, the claimant has been fundamentally dishonest, but if there is an element of what's the best word for it, either complicity in, in that dishonesty or facilitating it, perhaps, uh, or actually, you know, not doing anything, any positive step or act. And I don't mean a positive step or act to the court, but at least putting something on file to say, well, uh, I, I've been informed or I've seen or my expert has told me that uh, what you've said is inconsistent or, or not compatible with the injury you're claiming. You know, the sort of people that um, elaborate some physical symptoms or disability or, or paralysis for the choices, either psychological gain, some form of somatization, or uh, financial gain. So I don't think that uh, solicitors be the for, for you know, the claimant or, or, or for the defendant uh, can be passive uh, in, in, in their own particular ways. There's still responsibilities on the claim solicitors to, to do uh, and not be complicit. And clearly, as we've talked about, there's responsibilities and needs for the defendant solicitors to, to clearly consider fundamental dishonesty and what they need to, to prove that uh, and not go steaming straight in with that as a banner headline in, in the particulars of response or the uh, defence. If that's what you think, you have to be often a little bit more patient. I think those are all the questions that we've been asked and I, I note that it's just gone one o'clock so uh, unless anybody else has any further questions I think probably um, that's all from us. Uh, I just want to um, draw to your attention our next webinar uh, which is on the 25th of February 2021. Uh, that will be by, led by Ian Stebbings and Francesco O'Neill on the subject of police law. Um, I'm just checking the Q&A again. No, I can't see any left to be answered. Um, so David, unless there's anything else from you? No. I want to thank everybody for, for coming along. Um, what we would be planning, or we are planning to do, is to put a more structured sort of uh, case uh, structure and worked examples into another fundamental dishonesty webinar in due course. So just watch that space. That might be useful and something that we looking to expect to get a number of Q's and A's on each step so it will be a bit more interactive hopefully than, than just sitting and listening to something for an hour. <laughs> Great well thank you very very much for me as well to everyone that's joined us um, and we will sign off there I think. Thank you. Good afternoon all. <laughs>